The season is almost at its midway point and it's time to grade your Montreal Canadiens coming up next. All right, hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Matt, welcome to the Sinbin. Now, the Canadians played around 38 games, I believe. By the time you're listening to this, it's going to be past the midway point. And what I wanted to do today, I wanted to look at every player individually, talk about them, and kind of grade them. You know, the grades can be A, A+, plus, B, B+, plus, etc., etc. You guys all did school, it's all great. Now, we're going to sit through and we're going to grade them. Enough chit-chat. Now, before I do get into it, though, I just wanted to add, you can see to my left, the Habs Nation podcast, we go live every Sunday. So if you like this video and if you like me talking about the Canadians, well, first of all, make sure to subscribe and like. Second of all, make sure to head over to that podcast and check out my content. So without further ado, what we're going to do here, I'm just going to put it up on the screen. You have here all of the forwards, all of the defensemen, and obviously the goalies for the Montreal Canadiens. And we're going to go through them one by one. And as I said, talk about them and grade them. So without further ado, why don't we just get ahead and start with Mr. Joel Armia, number 40. So looking at his stats quickly, he has 21 points in 35 games. Not bad, not bad. So when we first acquired Joel Armia, if you remember, it was kind of a salary situation. We took on Steve Mason's contract, the goalie that was with Winnipeg. And uh, in addition, we acquired Joel Armia, just something to sweeten the package. I thought it was going to be kind of a throw-in deal, you know, just something like that. And his first few seasons with the Canadians, or his first season with the Canadians, I wasn't overly impressed. I always thought a guy that is six foot four, two hundred and thirteen 213 pounds, he offers something that not any of the other Canadians offer, and that is size. Now, I will say, while he hasn't really brought in that physicality, He's really stepped it up this year in the stats department. Again, looking at his stats, 12 goals in 35 games. If my quick math serves me right, he's, got, he's on pace for about 30 goals, which is everything you would expect for this type of player. Um, I don't always listen to TSN, but I liked one quote that someone said on the morning show. They said, if you erased Armia's name, and if you erased any notion about him to start the season with, you would think he's one of the prime power forwards in this league. Because some nights he's played like that. And then again, some nights he tends to go a little bit invisible. So enough chit-chat. Why don't I just give my final score? Joel Armia, his mid-report grade, I give him an A-. minus. Again, he's not that bad. I think he's really stepped it up. He's having a bounce back here. Some nights he tends to go a little bit invisible. Some nights I feel when the going gets tough, I want to see him bring that physicality. But other than that, I am completely pleased with Joel Armia. I think that it's another great coup by Mark Bergevin and he should keep it up. But now, why don't we just advance to our another forward? And we are getting to, if my computer would load, Mr. Riley Barber. Number 45. So, so far this year, Barber, he played only nine games. He has zero goals, zero assists, zero points. Now, I hesitated to even put Barber in this video because we've had such a short sample size with him and I can't really grade him. And then again, my expectations weren't that high to begin with. I know he's a great AHL player and he's nothing really more than that. I don't see him being in the NHL when some of the other players get healthy, such as Drouin and, uh, and uh, Byron. Now, speaking of Byron, I compared him to a poor man's Byron. He's not the biggest, but he's kind of fast and he can bring some of that forechecking abilities. But with that being said... There's nothing really more he can bring. Again, he's more of an AHL type player. So why don't I just get to grading Mr. Barber? Um, not much to be said. I'm just going to go ahead and give him a C plus here. I think he's fulfilling his role fine. But I think we're quickly seeing he's not really an NHL player. But that's okay. That's okay. Because we are quickly moving to our next player. And that is, speaking of Paul Byron, Mr. 41 himself, Paul Byron. Again, Really short sample size we've had so far with Byron. In 19 games, he's had only one goal, three assists, and four points. Not overall very impressed with Byron, I'm going to have to admit. Now, um, we talked about Armia having a bounce back here. You know, the year before, didn't get too many goals, didn't get too many points. I feel like with Paul Byron, he's having the reverse of a bounce back here. He's taking a step back this year. 
I want to blame a lot of that on the injuries, okay? I don't think it's the player slowing down due to age or anything like that or abilities. I think that a lot of his injuries in the past have had to do with it. Again, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I don't think that fighting Mackenzie Weger was a very intelligent decision for Paul Byron, all right? Paul Byron is no Mackenzie Weger. We actually need him. He's a goal scorer. He has speed. He has a forecheck. And he wears an A, and he wears it for a reason, all right? He has an important role on this team. But that fight and that concussion, I'm looking at him play this year, and I'm saying, man, this isn't the same player. Now, then again, he might get healthy. He might come back with the Canadians, and he might be back to the old Paul Byron we all know and love. But in this short sample size, I cannot say that we definitely got that. And due to that, for my grade for Paul Byron, I am giving him a C-. minus. Again, very short sample size, but given his play in that short sample size, I cannot justify giving him a passing grade. What's a passing grade anyway? A C or a C plus? Anyway, I give Paul Byron a C minus. And why don't we move on to another player, a new player for the Canadians this year. It is Mr. Nick Cousin. You see in the background, he used to play for the Coyotes. Uh, we signed him this offseason. And so far in 33 games played, he has five goals, seven to six and 12 points so again with nick cousins listening to some of the pundits you know on the radio and just on youtube a lot of people seem to be comparing him to andrew shaw for whatever reason as i take a sip of my coffee so a lot of people seem to be comparing him to andrew shaw um we ended up trading andrew shaw to the chicago blackhawks i ended up getting a few picks out of it and a lot of people are saying Wow, Nick Cousins, who's going to replace some of that grit, he's going to replace some of what Andrew Shaw brought. Now, if I were to compare both players, Shaw with Cousins, again, I don't like that comparison, but everyone seemed to be doing it. I do have to say, Nick Cousins, not having known much about him prior to this season, he doesn't really bring the physical edge that Andrew Shaw brought. You know, Andrew Shaw, he's really that gritty type player, someone who would block a shot face first, you know, someone who would drop the gloves. I can't really say I see that with Nick Cousins. But once my brain realized that, once my brain realized that, you know, Nick Cousins and Andrew Shaw, they're two different players, I sort of I sort of started to like Nick Cousins. I mean, he does forecheck very efficiently. There's some games where he seems to be the best player on the ice, you know, very few limited games, but still, I think that if he plays on a third line, or maybe once the other players get healthy, once he slots into that fourth line, he can be really valuable to this team. And again, standing in at, you know, 5'11", not the shortest, but not the biggest either. I think he can prove to have some value. And then again, it's not like we're paying the moon for this player. It's not like we're paying him $10 million and he's not giving anything, you know. We, pay, we paid a little price for this player. And I think that so far, he's shown to be worth that price. So why don't I just shut up and grade him? I'm going to give him a B, you know, a, a nice B there for Nick Cousins. I'm uh, impressed with his play so far. Um, I would like to see a little bit more points on the board, but so far, I can't say that he's deceived my expectations, okay? So now that that's done, let's move on to our next forward. And don't worry, the defense and the goalies are going to be coming up. But for our next forward, we are going to be talking about Philip Deneau. So Philip Deneau, six foot one, two hundred and one pounds. In thirty nine games played, he has ten goals, twenty assists for thirty points. He also has a plus minus ten. Why do I bring that up? Because a lot of people think it's bullshit. I disagree. First of all, I love plus and minus, but I bring that up because Philip Deneau has the hardest job on this team. Maybe him and Shea Weber and Carey Price. Those three players have the hardest job because they have to face the toughest opposition every night imagine you're playing the boston bruins you're not going to go up against david backus you're not going to go up against krejci you're going up against bergeron and marshan and posternak so what he doesn't have a point per game but the fact alone that he's going up against the toughest opposition and he's not only surviving he's succeeding i love philip deno he is quickly becoming one of my favorite players on this team you know I didn't know much about him when he was drafted originally by the Chicago Blackhawks. Obviously moved on to the Montreal Canadiens in that one-sided trade, if I might say so myself. But you know what? Philip Deneau, like I said, he's quickly becoming one of my favorite players. 
A lot of people have him in talks for the Selkie. I believe that last season he, what, fuck, finished like uh, fifth in voting, was it? Anyway, a lot of people have in talks. I'm not, I'm not quite sure he's ever going to get nominated because he plays in the same league as Taves and Kopitar and Barkov and all of those guys. I don't know if there's any one year he's going to beat out those three players. O'Reilly too. But that being said, for what we paid for Philip Deneau and for the contract he has and for the type of play he brings year day in and day out, I love this player. And I got to apologize. I put on the thumbnail that he has an A. I'm going to have to change it here because now that I'm talking, I've convinced myself. Philip Deneau gets an A+. A lot of people might disagree with me. But I think the fact alone that he has to face the hardest opposition, he plays a great two-way game, rarely makes any mistake on the ice, and then he still has 30, uh, 30 points in 39 games on pace for around 60 points. Philip Deneau gets an A+. Change my mind. All right, enough of that. And you know what? What to say? We see a lot of French-Canadian players coming in the system, whether it be Maxime Lapierre, whether it be Guillaume Latendresse, and we're just waiting for that one French Canadian to succeed. I think Philippe Deneau is that one guy. Anyway, so enough of that. Why don't I move on to my next one? Ah, God, I, I lost my page. Let me just take a sip of my pot. All right. Our next one might be controversial too. We are going to be talking about Mr. Max Domi himself. First of all, I really liked it when he had the long hair. I don't know why he had to shave it. You know, a lot of people said he looked like that guy from Tales from the Crypt Keeper. I disagree. I thought it actually looked good, but we're not here to talk about his looks. We're here to talk about his hockey. And in 39 games played, he has 11 goals, 18 assists, 29 points. I got to admit, being a big Max Domi fan, having his jersey, counterfeit nonetheless, but having his jersey, being a big fan, I got to say, I'm a little tiny bit disappointed. Why am I disappointed? You might be saying, he has almost the same number of points as Dano. You know, and you just finish jizzing all over Dano. Why are you not doing the same with Domi? I am not doing the same with Domi because we are expecting bigger offensive numbers from Max Domi. He is the team's most offensive player. Dano isn't. On the contrary, he's the team's most defensive player. So the points are sort of a bonus. And while Max Domi in the points department, he hasn't been awful in any which way. I am expecting a little bit more, especially coming off of that 72-point season. Now, I do have to say, in the past couple of weeks, in the past couple of days, he's completely turned things around. He hasn't only looked like the Max Domi of last year, but he's looked like the, ma the best Max Domi I've ever seen. He's looked like Max Domi from the World Juniors, for Christ's sake. I, five goals in his past five games. This is the Max Domi we expect. Unfortunately... It took all of this time, 20-something games, to get that version of Max Domi. He had a wicked slump at some point during the year, um, around the 10-game mark, if, if memory serves me right. But, you know, with Max Domi, he's a competitor. He has it in his blood, if you've ever seen his father play. He's a competitor, and he's always going to compete. And if he's not going to put points on the board... I do think he does bring a lot of intangibles. He brings a lot of great attitude. He brings a lot of grit and dirt to that team, something that the team is severely lacking. Um, again, at five foot ten, I don't know how much uh, dirt you can bring onto the uh, opposing team, but still, I'll take it anyway. I love Max Domi. I love it. But I do have to acknowledge he's taken a little bit of a step back. So I'm going to take that into account with my score. And for now on, I'm going to give him... A B. All right, Max Domi, he's been a B. If he continues the way he's been going this past few weeks, don't be surprised to see that score go a little bit higher come my final grades for this year. But for right now, Domi gets a B. I will add something. The fact that Domi hasn't been lights out, the fact that he hasn't been the Domi of last season, it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know why? This is his contract year. All right? I'll give you an, another example. Nathan McKinnon, a completely separate flair, player from Max Domi. I think we can all agree that McKinnon is better. But when he signed that contract, his latest contract, he wasn't coming off of the best year. It was kind of a down year. And they signed him long-term at a bargain deal. Mark Bergevin, Max Domi isn't having the best year. 
Now is the time to sign him long-term at a bargain deal. You know, there is no reasons to not sign him. If they give him another bridge deal, I'm going to shoot myself in the testicles because I hate bridge deals. Sign him long-term, get him at that low price. It's time to get bargains in. Speaking about bargains, why don't we move on to our next player? Mr. Jonathan Drouin. I'm going to have to say, contrary to Matt's Domi, I prefer Drouin with the short hair. I don't think that the long hair did him any service. I mean, just look at that salad. It makes him look like a garbage man. Anyway, again, not here for the looks. In 19 games played, Drouin had 7 goals, 8 assists, and, uh, and uh, 15 points. My apologies. So 15 points in 19 games. Before he went down with that injury, people were starting to say, Wow, Drouin, he's finally turned it around. He's always going to have that pedigree of the third overall pick. And we all know in Montreal how much skill he has. It just seems like translating that on paper and translating it to the NHL level hasn't always been there with Drouin. In fact, earlier this year, I was on a boat. I made a video of trading Jonathan Drouin. I got to admit, I sort of regret that video after the short sample size we've seen of Drouin this year. But I do have to say, if Drouin is going to succeed in this league, he cannot do this only over 19 games. He has to do it over 19 seasons. All right, we have to see great consistency from Drouin and one of the biggest drawbacks from Drouin, one of the biggest criticism by the most avid Drouin haters, it always was, well, he has all of the skill, he has the best speed, the best shot, etc., but he doesn't have the work ethic. From day one this season, what, they played the Carolina Hurricanes? I noticed the new Drouin. He looked completely new. It looked like Gallagher slapped him in the face and said, dude, wake up, play more like me. And you know what? Drouin has done just that. I'm not going to give him the highest grade available because it has been a short sample size and I just can't give him a high grade over that short sample size. But so far what I've seen this season, I've liked it so far and I'm going to give him an A-. minus. I think that having him injured and seeing the Canadians play of late, people are starting to see how important Jonathan Drouin is to this team. And I got to admit, for someone who's shit on him so much in the past, I'm sort of starting to miss him. I, I miss you, Jonathan. Get your wrist healed. What is it? A wrist injury? Whatever it may be. Just get it healed. We need you. All right. Speaking of Brendan Gallagher, he's, oh, my apologies. He's my next player. Number 11, Brendan Gallagher. He's actually my favorite player on the Canadians. He only stands at 5'9", but a chunky 184 pounds. And thus far, in 15 games, he, uh, sorry, in 39 games, he has 15 goals, 17 assists, and 32 points. Brendan Gallagher is Brendan Gallagher. I, I mean, what can I say? I think the only Brendan Gallagher thing I haven't liked in the past decade is that Gallagher burger from McDonald's. But... Um, for the hockey aspect, Gallagher has been Gallagher. He's been lights out. There's no player in the league that works harder than him. I will repeat that. There is no player in the league that works harder than Gallagher. He is a workhorse. If he had the body frame of Ovechkin, he'd be the greatest hockey player of all time. All right? And this year hasn't been different. The thing I like about Gallagher the most is that he first scored that 20-goal season. People said... All right, this is the Gallagher we're going to get. The Gallagher at his prime is going to score 20 goals. What does he do the next season? Scores 30 goals. What do the people say? All right, this is the Gallagher we're going to get. 30 goals, no more. This year, if he has a good second half to the year, and if the players, you know, Drouin can get healthy and, uh, you know, give some depth to that team, I wouldn't be surprised if he touches the 40-goal mark. I really wouldn't. And also, another thing about Gallagher... He scores a lot of goals. He's not a natural-born scorer. If you look at a lot of the goals he scores, they're all garbage goals where he just gets in front of the net, gets a tip, or just the ugliest goals of all time. And I don't care. I don't care because goals are goals. And for a team that's starving for goals, I give Gallagher an A+. My highest grade. So far, only him and, and uh, Dano got it. And they play on the same line, so that says a lot. So, you know, I love Brendan Gallagher. I think that had it not been for Shea Weber, he'd be the obvious choice for captain. But 
hey, what are you going to do? We're going to get to him later. Okay. It's time to get killed right now. And why? <laughs> we are talking about Jesperi Kot Kinyemi. I'm not even going to bother looking at his stats because it's not worth it. I think even the most avid Canadians fan will admit he's not having the best of seasons. Okay? Now, my channel, I have one on record for... I hate using the term, but calling out Jesperi Kot Kinyemi. Saying he was overrated in some which way. And I got mocked. I got disliked. It was my most disliked video in history on the sin bin. So when I say that about Kokenyemi, when I say he's overrated, the reason why I say that is because I see a lot of hype coming towards this player. And I think that's unfair for the player himself. I think that's unfair for the fan base. And I just think it's not true. So I just tried to temper expectations. And I think that this year, seeing Jesperi Kokenyemi's play, He's tempered the expectation through his play. Now, do I think this is the normal Kokanyemi we're going to get on an average day basis when he's on his prime? Absolutely not. He is much better than what we've seen so far. And in two games back from injury, he's had two goals. The problem, though, is that after a solid rookie campaign, it's solid, he got 30 points, but it's still solid for an 18-year-old in this league, we expect him to take a step forward. All right, maybe not statistics wise. I don't really care about the stats, but just play wise, we expect him to take a few steps forward. And unfortunately, he hasn't done that. You guys might say it's a sophomore slump. Sure, let's chalk it up to that. But the fact of the matter is, when I look at Yasperi Kokinyemi, I really hate to say this because I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I see a guy that's not fully ready yet. And when I say not fully ready, I'm not talking about his hockey sense because the kid does have great hockey sense. He's able to find his teammates on the ice. Drew Wise scored a great power play goal early this season against the St. Louis Blue, and it was Jesperi Kotinelli's pass that fed him. You know, no, when I say he's not ready yet, is his physical maturity. I have not seen a player in all of my 10 plus years watching this team, I have not seen a player fall on his ass as much as Jesperi Kotkinemi. He has the balance of a baby giraffe, all right? And I don't really think it's normal. And having played the limited hockey that I've played, the one thing they teach you when you first start skating is that you kind of have to sort of bend your knees as if you're squatting. So that way it's easier to retain your balance and you're less likely to fall. And don't lean forward because when you lean forward, you're just off balance and you're more likely to fall. When I look at Kokinemi, it always seems like he's leaning forward. And due to that off-centered balance, he's always finding himself on his ass. And there was no better example than when he got clobbered by Nikita Zadorov. Was it a dirty hit? Yeah. Was it a suspendable hit? Yeah, absolutely. Was it a slew foot? Well, depending on your definition for a slew foot, yeah, absolutely. But had Risperi Kokinemi had better balance, and had he had a, you know maybe a bigger frame, a little bit more weight... He wouldn't have cartwheeled the way he did. He wouldn't have landed on his neck. I mean, touch wood. Thank God it wasn't more dangerous than it ended up being. He only missed a couple of weeks, I think. But the fact is with Jesperi Kotkinemi, I don't think he has the physical maturity. You know what the Canadians have to do this offseason? Because this past offseason, he trained on his own in Finland. All right? Canadians, if I'm the management, I'm saying Jesperi, you're coming with me. You're training with the Canadians management. You're not training on your own in Finland. We saw how that worked out. You're training with us. We're going to give you better balance. We're going to give you more physical maturity. And I think that once that physical maturity sets in, once he's no longer falling on his ass the amount of times he does, I think we have a dangerous player here. I don't think he's quite on the level of Nick Suzuki. I still think he's going to be a very good number two center in this hockey team. So for now, Mr. Jesperi Kotkinemi, I am going to give you a C+. It's a passing grade. I, I think I'm nice when I give this grade. But nonetheless, I think that as a fan base, if we look at Jesperi Kotkinemi's play this year, and if we're happy with it, I mean, we should raise our expectations a little bit. So that's all I have to say on Jesperi Kotkinemi. 
I often come off as a hater of Coke Kinyemi and Price, who we'll get to later, but it's not true. It's not true. I just call myself a realist. When people are overhyping a player, I like to bring them down to earth. So if you guys are still with me and you haven't disliked me yet or shut the video yet, we're going to go along and move on to his fellow Finn, Mr. Arthury Lekkonen. All right. He's actually six foot, which I didn't know. I always thought he was like five foot nine, five foot ten. But no, I guess he is six foot. In 39 games played, he has seven goals and 18 points. So similar to what I said with Dano, I'm going to repeat a lot of what I said. When it comes to Lekkonen, I don't really care about the points. You know, I look more for the defensive side because he is considered a two-way forward. He is considered more of a defensive forward. And I think that Arturi Lekkonen overall, he's brought that this year. I can't really complain. Now, he's become kind of the butt end of a lot of jokes here in Montreal. A lot of people are saying he gets these prime opportunities, these great A chances, and he always seems to whiff or miss the net or hit the post or shoot on the goalie. And you know what? And that's true. I'm not going to make any excuses. Some players are born with it. Some players aren't. You know, some players have that natural goal scoring instinct. Arturi Lekkonen doesn't have it. But with that being said, you know, the people who say he, cre he gets those prime chances... And he doesn't put it in. He gets those prime chances in the first place. Because of his work ethic. Because of how relentless he is on the puck. So while it does suck that he can't put it in. He's getting those chances in the first place. Because of how relentless he is. That's always how I saw Arturi Lekkinen. And I kind of settled in my brain that he doesn't have that um, natural goal scoring sense. Sort of like how I felt with Lars Eller. Lars Eller almost always seemed to have a grade 8 chance in front of the net or he's in the slot or whatever it may be and he whiffs on the puck. So once I started lowering my expectation thinking, okay, well, Lars Eller, maybe he's not the first line player we thought he was going to be. And when I did the same with Arturi Lekkonen, I can't help but like this player. You know, honestly, it seems like every single shift he's moving his feet, similar to Gallagher sort of, but maybe not quite on the same level. I challenge you, any one of you guys, look at one shift of Artuli Lekkonen. Look for one shift where he's not moving your feet. You can't find it. You absolutely can't find it. I mean, the kid has great work ethic, and I think that's why Claude Julien relies on him so much. He is a darling of Claude Julien. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if they sleep in the same bed and then go for salads every Friday. I mean, they love each other, those two players. So <laughs> with that being said, Mr. Lekkonen... I'm going to give him a nice B plus. You know, actually, let me give him a B because it's not like he's Wayne Gretzky out there. But still, a nice solid B. I think that he's very valuable to this team. And while a lot of people don't necessarily like him because of the reasons I mentioned uh, previously, I do think he has his worth on this team. So moving forward, why don't we move on to our next forward? And we're almost done with the forwards, but uh, before we move on to our defensemen, I will have to get to, if the screen will switch, all right, here we go, Ryan Paling, another big one, another big one. So with Ryan Paling, I think the worst thing to have happened to this player is that hat trick he had last year against the Toronto Maple Leafs. What a thing to say, you guys might say, yeah, wishing, uh, wishing ill will on a player. I get it. I get it. But the problem is... After that hat trick he had, after that excellent game where he scored the shootout winner, probably a dream game, expectations were raised with Ryan Paling. These unreal expectations where, you know, maybe people didn't think he would get a hat trick every game, but some people said, hey, he's going to be a 70 plus point player in his rookie year, or yada, yada, yada. You know, that's not what Ryan Paling is, okay? He's not that type of player, and I think that this far, this year, we're starting to see that. But that being said, he's only a 20-year-old. It's his first year in this league. And throughout 12 games, he obviously has zero goals, zero points. I mean, I'm not expecting the moon for someone who plays fourth-line minutes with fourth-line players. It's hard to get on the, on the stat sheet. It's hard. But with that being said, 
I've sort of been pleased with his play. It's not like he's been great out there. I don't think he's having the rookie campaign Nick Suzuki was having. But while I'm on the comparison of those two players, when Nick Suzuki first came in with this team, who was he playing with? Thompson and Nick Cousins. He was playing on the fourth line. He was playing fourth line minutes. He wasn't playing on the power play whatsoever. And what did the coach do? He saw once he saw uh, Nick Cous- uh, sorry Nick Suzuki's play, once he saw him getting more comfortable out there, stop giving turno- turnovers and stop getting clobbered, he started trusting him. He started giving him more minutes. And I wouldn't be surprised if for Ryan Paling, the same thing happened. But for right now, he still has to prove himself. All right? And there's some plays where I look at Ryan Paling and I'm like, you know what? That wasn't the right decision to do. That was a bad pass, a bad play, whatever it may be. But he still is pretty young and he still is adapting to the NHL. I mean, it's a big leap still to go from the USA college program to the AHL to the NHL. In my books, it's still a pretty big leap. All right. Not all players can do it like this. Not all players are Austin Matthews or Patrick Liney where they can just jump into the scene and be lights out. So I think with Ryan Paling, if I were his coach, which I am not, which I'm not, I would say keep up the good work, keep working hard. I know you're not getting any goals. I know you're not getting many minutes. But if you keep proving yourself, you will get second line minutes time. You will get power play time. And if ever there's further more injuries, you're the first guy to go up in the lineup. So that's what I have to say with Ryan Paling. I almost forgot to score him. I'm going to have to give him a B minus. All right. A little bit of disappointment in his game. But really nothing to be alarmed about. This is really not, uh, normal. We see this a lot with young hockey players where they don't always you know, have the best results starting off. But once they get their feet warm, I wouldn't be surprised to see Ryan Paling's grade go up to maybe an A. Who knows? But for now, we are going to move on. And I'm going to skip Matthew Pekka because that's way too small of a sample size. But <laughs> speaking of Ryan Paling and speaking of Nick Suzuki, we are moving on. To Mr. Suzuki himself. Nick Suzuki, number 14. As you see on this photo, he was 88. He changed his number once uh, Platanic retired. In 39 games played, he's had 7 goals, 16 assists, 23 points. He's had only 4 penalty minutes, 2 power play goals, yada, 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 yada. So, with Nick Suzuki, I think that as of the time of this recording, he's been playing his best hockey. He's absolutely been playing his best hockey hockey when he first started i don't know if you guys remember this is really going back but that first game against toronto that first game against toronto was a disaster for both suzuki and his rookie counterpart kill flurry he gave a horrible giveaway in the behind the net and i was just thinking oh my god after a really solid preseason is suzuki ready for the nhl Uh, should he go back in the ahl i mean what's going on but the thing with Suzuki, he's kind of a chameleon. He, he adapts to his environment and he adapts to the speed. One of the biggest drawbacks to this player was he doesn't have the footwork. He doesn't have the speed to keep up with, a, a, I don't know, Connor McDavid. You know what? Having watched Andre Markov year after year after year and being my favorite defenseman on the Montreal Canadiens possibly ever, you don't always need speed to survive in this league. There's a small percentage of players, very small albeit, but there's a small percentage of players who can uh, get away without having excellent foot speed. But what you need in compensation is great hockey sense. Nick Suzuki, he's faster than Markov. We, We can all agree to that. He just maybe doesn't have that prime speed we expect from an NHL player. But that doesn't matter because he's in that small percentage of players who can get by because of his excellent hockey sense. I absolutely love Nick Suzuki. If you guys have been following my channel for amount of time, I made a video ranking the top 10 Canadians prospect. Um, I think it was 10 or 15 or whatever it was. I didn't have him really that high, all things considered. I think I had him, um, what, like fourth or something like that. After what I've seen from him this year, he rockets all the way up to two or one. I'm not joking because the way that he's adapted himself going from that young player we saw in the first game against Toronto to the player we see now, he's a great player. I don't think there's any way at his prime he gets less than a point per game. 
He is too smart of a player. He is too good of the player. And, you know, while people are criticizing his footwork, there's nothing wrong with a player slowing down the pace of a game. Patrick Kane there in Chicago does the same thing. It's not like he's blowing past defenders. You know, he, he likes to take his time, slow down the pace. And I see a lot of similarities in Patrick Kane's game to Nick Suzuki game. Actually, I think if there's a player to compare them, uh, Nick Suzuki, it would be Patrick Kane. Another good one would be uh, Leon Dreisaitl. Why? They can both play center. They can both play the wing. And they both don't have the greatest foot speed. If you look at Dreisaitl, it's not like he's blowing past defenders either. It's not like he's a figure skater out there. He's kind of a little bit slower. Yet he can play on the same line as McDavid. He can keep up with McDavid. Why? He has the brains. Okay? Nick Suzuki is going to be a poor man's dry settle. And I mean that in the best ways possible. So for Nick Suzuki, I am going to have to give him an A-. minus. You know, the reason why I'm not giving him an A or A- plus is because... I think it was a little bit more difficult for him the beginning of the season, just getting used to that pace and whatever, sort of with, what with Paling is going through. But now that he's adapted himself and, you know, after the holiday break, we've seen some great hockey from Nick Suzuki. Wow, the sky's the limit for this player, all right? So, by the way, he's the grand or the, the nephew of, um, what's that other Suzuki guy? Chris, what's his name? The, the environment guy. Anyway, it doesn't matter. All right. Moving on to our next player, we are going with Thomas Tatar. Now, if you would have told me to begin the season that Tatar would lead the team with 35 points in 39 games, 16 goals, I would think that you are on acid, all right? I would think you are on acid because I wouldn't have believed you. You know, Thomas Tatar, he was always considered the throw-in in the Max Pacioretty deal. You know, the, the main piece was considered Suzuki, uh, Nick Suzuki, who the name of his uncle is still bothering me. I can't get it. It's on the tip of my tongue, uh, Nick Suzuki. But um, he's always thought to be the throw-in in the, in the deal. Now that the two seasons have gone along with the Canadians, I got to say, Tatar has been more than a throw-in. I think it's a disservice to call this player a throw-in because he's offered some great hockey for this team. Some absolutely great hockey. When we talk about some of the players that I've talked about previously on the list that don't have that natural scoring instinct, it's quite the opposite with Tatar. Tatar is a goal scorer. He's going to get you a good 25 goals a year, and you can count on that. And that's what I like about Tatar. He's also a relentless forechecker. If you remember, when the Pacioretty deal was done, all right, when Pacioretty won, that was around the time where Bergevin, he was stressing attitude. He was stressing hard work, and the rookies had to wear those dumb t-shirts with no excuses, or um, attitude is everything, or whatever it was. It was some cheesy Hallmark shit. Anyway, I wouldn't be surprised if Mark Bergevin had a great hand in bringing in Thomas Tatar over from the Vegas Golden Knights to the Montreal Canadiens. All right? Maybe, who knows, maybe the initial deal was Pacioretty for Suzuki in a third, or a second, or whatever it was. And then maybe Bergevin comes and says, hey... That guy, Tatar, he wasn't even playing in your lineup. Why don't you just throw him over? And then maybe the GM for Vegas said, you know what? Maybe that'll free up some cap space. Yeah, sure. Why not? So he was always viewed as that throw-in. David Suzuki, is that it? David, yeah. David, all right. David Suzuki, that environment liberal guy, whatever he's called. I liked this TV show when I was young. Anyway, Th Thomas Tatar has been great thus far, and I think that at 35 points or whatever it is, leading the team in points, he has surpassed every expectation. So for my final grade, though, I'm going to have to give him an A-. minus. Why an A-, minus? you might say? After everything I've said, after I've finished pumping his tires, Thomas Tatar has one very bad downside. The penalties. He has taken some of the laziest penalties I've seen. And they're so frustrating. A lot of them are the, on the offensive zone. And credit to Claude Julien, who very rarely he would have benched him due to one of those penalties. He kept his cool. I know if I were the coach, I would have benched him a long time ago. And when I say bench, I mean healthy scratch. You're not even playing the game. But it seems that Thomas Tatar, I say lazy, a lot of the penalties he takes are from his forecheck. Are from his forecheck. But... Like with Gallagher, 
it's important to really uh, be in control, to not take any bad penalties. Because it seems with Thomas Tatar, he is often putting his team in a hole. And do I have the penalty minutes here? Yeah. In 39 games, he has 28 penalty minutes. I mean, I feel you just can't do that. If there's one major drawback to Thomas Tatar, it's the fact that he's always taking some dumb penalties. But that doesn't matter because we are moving on. And who do we have next? Who do we have next? All right. The only Jew on the Canadians, Nate Thompson. He obviously converted to Judaism to please his wife. You know what they say, happy wife, happy life, or whatever it is. All right, six foot one, 205 pounds, 39 games played. He has nine points. So similarly to Joel Armia, he offers a lot of size on this team. He's only six foot one, but it's a very chunky six foot one. All right, he, he's a strong guy. And one thing a lot of Canadians player might not know, he can throw them. He can throw them with some of the best in this league. He doesn't do it much. Hockey is sort of dying out in the NHL, but he can absolutely throw them. But most importantly with Thompson, more so than the physicality, which I'm not really expecting it from him, he brings stability on the fourth line. I don't envision any best fourth line player in the league than Nate Thompson. He's the type of guy, if you're making a push for the Stanley Cup and you need a really, really good fourth line player who can take draws, who can kill penalties, who will very rarely make a mistake, Nate Thompson is that guy, all right? There's not much else to say about him. He seems like a very good team guy too. If you look at the videos behind the scenes in the locker room, he seems like a great team guy. So for all of those reasons that I mentioned, I don't think there's any way I cannot give Nate Thompson an A-, minus. you know? Uh, I'm not giving him an A or A+, because just, again, a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, there's always more improvement. Any player can be have more improvement, uh, unless you're Dano or Gallagher, I guess, but whatever. So that's what I had to say for Nate Thompson. I know it's not really long, but, hey, he's kind of self-explanatory. He's also from Alaska. There's not too many of those in the NHL, so fun fact. And last but not least for the forwards, we have number 43, Jordan wheel so wheel in 31 games played he has four goals three assists and seven points now with jordan wheel i'm gonna echo a lot of what i've said previously he doesn't offer a lot of size and on a team that are flooded with forwards that are tiny whether it be domi whether it be gallagher whether it be not a forward but victor mete uh, whether it be thomas tatar and a team that's flooded with forwards that are tiny. Jordan Wheel's worth sort of gets diminished a little bit because you're just adding another thing that we have a lot of. So that's always how I view Jordan Wheel. But with that being said, I think that he's a tremendous player in terms of his work ethic. He's definitely a player that cares. I can tell right off the bat watching the Canadians game that he hates losing. He absolutely hates losing. But coming off a great junior career, and, you know, he's, he's done great things in junior. I've sort of expected a little bit more. And last season, from what we've seen from Jordan Wheel, I was expecting a tiny bit more. Because last season, he played great. We only had him for a short stint, but he ended up getting a contract after the, the offseason. I mean, I was expecting a little tiny bit more. But one thing I will have to say about Jordan Wheel, to my very surprise, he can quarterback a power play. I mean, he's a very good power play quarterback. We often see Max Domi, you know, on the hash wall, almost on the blue line. And we often see him cough it up and cause an odd man rush. That's not the case with Wheel. Wheel seems very concentrated on the power play. And he'll very rarely make a mistake or get it intercepted or anything like that. I think that Jordan Wheel's real worth, it's on the power play, believe it or not. And if you don't believe me, just look at the Canadians' power play stats this year. They are lights out. And I definitely think that Jordan Wheel has a lot to do with this. So with all that being said, I'm going to give Mr. Wheel a B-. minus. Okie dokie. So we're done with the forwards. Let me take a sip of my coffee. All right. Let me know what you guys think of that so far. Do you agree with my rankings? Do you disagree? Uh, when everything is said and done, I would love to see your guys' grades and what you give every player. So... Um, with all that said and done, why don't we just move on to defensemen here? And uh, 
we are starting off with a big one, quite literally. We are starting off with, oops, sorry, wrong button. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Kale Flurry, big kid, number 20, six foot one, 205 pounds. In 33 games, he only has one goal and one point. He's a minus three. I got to admit, looking at his stats, I'm surprised he only has one point. Uh, you would expect to get a secondary assist somewhere here and there. But anyway, that doesn't matter. He's a stay-at-home defenseman. The last thing I care about for stay-at-home defensemen is points. But most importantly with Kale Flurry, he gives size. He gives ruggedness. He gives dirt. And if you guys listen to the Habs Nation podcast in the past, I've said Kale Flurry is the most important prospect on the Canadians. Why? Why is he the most important prospect, you may ask? Because there are too many games this year where I saw the Canadians get bullied. The ones that come to mind is against Washington, against St. Louis. Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. Against St. Louis. Oh, God, my voice. Against St. Louis and against the Flyers. I think those are three games where the Canadians got bullied. And in those moments where the Canadians were getting bullied, I needed a savior. I needed a hero. I need a hero. I needed someone to step up on the Canadians and give them back some of their own medicine. Obviously, having a team of midgets, not a lot of people can do that, except one, Kale Flurry. It always seemed to me when the going gets tough, Kale Flurry rises to the challenge and is ready to clobber his opposition with an open ice hit or a solid body check or whatever it may be. A lot of people don't realize how important Kale Flurry is to this team. But I realize it. I mean, Kale, it might be a dumb name. It might be a gross vegetable. But I really do appreciate how he's playing this year. I, I really do. And with a lot of defensemen, when they first enter the league, you know, he's a little bit overaged. He's 21 years old. I mean, for a rookie, you know. I- I've seen younger defensemen being rookies. But anyway... I don't really see him make that many mistakes on the ice. Sure, here and there he's going to make a mistake in the blue moon. But regardless of that, I think he's played a very solid game. And I have a lot to criticize Joel Bouchard for. I don't like where the Rock is this season. But I really do like the work he's done with Kale Flurry. And my last thing I'm going to say, look at that baby face. Would you expect this guy to be a cold-hearted killer? I sure as hell wasn't. If you see this face and you see his name, Kale Flurry, you're probably thinking, what is he going to do? Tickle me to death? No. This guy can knock you flat on your ass. All right? Six foot. You know, for all I've said about the Canadians, the forwards being midget, I think it's quite the opposite for the defensemen. I mean, we're looking at Kale Flurry, six foot one, Ben Sherratt, six foot three, Jeff Petrie, six foot three, Shea Weber, six foot four, Mike Riley, six foot one. Fallen is six foot four. They have a lot of size on defense. You know, that is not their weakness. Well, their defense is their weakness, but it's not the size that's their weakness. Maybe it's more reading the plays and whatever, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Why don't I just go ahead and rate Kale Flurry? And for this rookie season, I don't see how I can't give him an A. I mean, he's surpassed my expectations, he's exceeded my expectations, and I am very pleased with his play so far. So, with everything said and done, Kale Fleury gets an A. I'm excited to hear what you guys say, actually. But moving on, we are going <laughs> to Ben Sherratt. Sh- uh, Shiarat, I don't know how to say his name, but I do know how to analyze his play. And he's had been playing some great hockey. One thing people forget, and at least I've been forgetting a lot, he's only 28 years old. We are getting a player smack dab in his prime. And similarly to the Andrew Shaw, Nick Cousins comparison, a lot of people were comparing Ben Shariot to Jamie Ben. I think that the fact that they both wear number eight has a lot to do with it. But it's also the fact due to that they both shoot left and uh, Jamie Ben left this team and we immediately replaced him with Ben Shariot. He's a replacement for Jamie Ben. So contrary to Cousins and Shaw, I get this comparisons. And I have to say... As much as I like Jamie Ben or Jordy Ben, as much as I like the Ben boys, I gotta say, Ben Sherratt is an upgrade in every sense of the word. 
I love Ben Sherratt. He's also a defensive-minded defenseman. But contrary to Kale Fleury, which is normal because he does have around seven years in age over him, he has five goals this year, eight assists, 13 points. He's going to absolutely shatter his goals total and his points total. But most importantly, he is playing on the first unit with Shea Weber. I think that they are a sound defensive pair. I mean, there's no other pair in the league. If I were a small forward, you know, five foot nine or whatever am I, five foot ten, and I'm facing Ben Schrott and Shea Weber, I would be shitting my pants. I would be shitting my hockey shorts. I hope they have insulation because nothing scares me more than having to face Shea Weber and Ben Schrott. Also, when I first saw that they signed Ben Schrott, this is back in the offseason, having not known anything about Ben Schrott, except that he can also throw them, very underrated uh, fighter, but I didn't know much about Ben Schrott. I was sort of scared it was going to be an Alsner situation. I think we all have the bad taste of Alsner in our mouth. Uh, that's what she said. But no, we all have the bad taste of Alsner in our mouth. And we were scared this is going to be another situation where we sign a player um, sort of long term, I guess three years, and we sign him to a lot of dough and he ends up going down in the AHL. I was scared shitless. But having seen him played with the Canadians, one thing he has over Carl Alsner is his skating. He's a tremendous skater. Another thing he has over Carl Alsner is his physicality. He can deliver the body, and like I said previously, he can fight. And a third thing he has over Carl Alsner, to my very surprise, 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 he's good in the offensive zone. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but sometimes when the forwards pass it back to the defenseman and say it's like Mike Raleigh, I'm like, okay, just don't fuck up. Don't give it away and we're good. No, not only does Ben Schrott not fuck it up, he's actually making some great plays. I love Ben Schrott. I mean, I absolutely love Ben Schrott. I want to get his jersey. That's how much I love him. Hey, you know what? Fuck all of y'all. I'm giving him an A+. I mean, who was expecting this much from Ben Schrott? I sure as hell wasn't. You know, and again, I might be more of a Ben Schrott fan than some of you guys. You might disagree with me. But whether you agree with me or not, can we all agree that hair gets an A plus alone? I mean, just look at that salad bowl. If I were rating the hairs on the Canadians, he would be number one. Coke Kanyemi would be number last. Anyway, so why don't we move on to the next defenseman? And our next defenseman, if my computer would load here, and my fucking sister's using up all the Wi-Fi. Huh. All right. An interesting one. Number 17 himself, Brett Kulak. So if my computer could load right here, and I apologize, guys. Uh, let's see. My computer's shitting the bed. Anyway, we don't need the stats quite yet. Okay. Brett Kulak, he's very interesting for me because we got him from Calgary. He also offered something that's quite valuable in this league, and that is a great skating defenseman, someone who can move the puck decently. But when it comes to Brett Kulak, Kulak, I'm sort of going to leave it at that. I'm going to give him a criticism I often gave Nathan Beaulieu or Borlo or whatever he's called. That they're tremendous skaters. You know, they, they have top speed for defensemen. They can move the puck. But one thing they're missing, it's the hockey IQ. That was always Nathan Borlo's biggest downside. And while I think that Brett Kulak is better than Nathan Borlo in those regards, I do think that sometimes he doesn't always have the IQ to keep up with some of the offensive players. And because of that, we oftentimes see him being a healthy scratch or the seventh defenseman or whatever it may be. Um, my computer finally loaded. So in 28 games played, he has only three assists, zero goals. Um, I do have to say, I think that his play last year was a tiny bit more solid. I'm a little bit disappointed in Brett Kulak. But then again, as a sixth or seventh defenseman, as a bottom pairing defenseman, I don't know what your expectations are in the first place, but mines aren't even that big. But anyway, it doesn't matter. So for Brett Kulak, uh, let me think here. Um, I'm going to give him a C plus. All right. He gets the passing grade, but nothing special. He sort of deceived me a little because again, I think that last year he was a little bit more solid, but that doesn't really matter. I think that he does have some worth to this team. I think that any puck moving defenseman and any fast skating defenseman has its worth on this team. But if we're looking at fast puck movers, 
and fast defenseman, look no further than number 53 himself, Victor Mete. Victor Mete only stands at 5'9", and for a defenseman, that's not always ideal. If you're 5'9", you need tremendous hockey sense to make sure that you're not getting clobbered by the oncoming four-checkers. I mean, imagine how it must feel for Victor Mete going to retrieve a puck in the corner and you turn over your shoulder and you see Ovechkin barreling down on you. Again, I hope his shorts are insulated because I would shit my pants. Anyway, the thing is with Victor Mete, unlike Kulak, he does have that IQ. He does have that awareness on the ice. And while he doesn't always have the points to back up, you know, only 29 games played, he has only 8 points. I think that defensively, he's been great for this team. And a lot of people, again, it was a running joke. When is he going to score his first goal? I mean, we're waiting for his first goal. Is it going to be today or is it going to be on Chinese New Year? No, he finally scored his first goal. He got the monkey off his back. He scored a second goal. <laughs> he got the second monkey off his back. I think that once us as fans, we stop looking to expect high offensive numbers from Victor Mete, the offensive numbers that he provided in juniors. I think that we're going to start appreciating for a hockey player that he is the way that I'm appreciating him. And I think that one thing that's really hurting him, speaking about the points department, one thing that's really hurting Victor Mete is the fact that he doesn't have the greatest shot. A lot of the goals that he's going to score in this in this hockey league, there's going to be like a weak wrist shot on net that hopefully there's going to be enough traffic that is blocking the goalie's vision. Or it's going to be the type of goals that, like his first goal, he joins the rush and he does a quick shot on net. Doesn't have to be the hardest, but just a shot on net and it goes in. You know, once we lower our expectations for Victor Mete, sort of what I'm going to say for Kokinyemi, once we lower our expectations, I think that we're going to start appreciating much more for the player that he is. And with all that said and done, I'm going to give Victor Mete a B. All right. Nothing too incredible. It's not like um, he's surpassed any expectations in any way. I would have to say he's met the expectations. I wasn't expecting anything less. I wasn't expecting anything more. I think that Victor Mete is a good, solid defenseman. And uh, let's hope that he can stay healthy in this league. Because I will say, five foot nine for a defenseman in this league, it's not always the easiest thing. It definitely is not always the easiest thing. But that doesn't matter. Because we are moving on. To someone who's not five foot nine. In fact, he's six foot three, and his name is Jeff Petrie. He actually gives Ben Schrott a run for his money for the best hair on the team. Um, he may have the best hair now that I'm looking at it, but at the age of 32, in 39 games played, he has 24 points. I gotta say, that's quite impressive. You know, for a defenseman, um, 24 points is pretty solid. One thing I will have to say with Jeff Petrie, I've been a little disappointed in his play this year. In the sense that it seems like the game, he's either really great and, you know, this is the defenseman that we want from Jeff Petrie and this is what we expect from him. Or it's the complete opposite where he's dog shit on wheels. It seems like there's nothing in the middle. It's either Bobby Orr or dog shit on wheels and there's nothing in the middle. I mean, we've seen Jeff Petrie have some huge brain farts. I'm not going to say that he's weak defensively because I don't believe that. I just think it's a situation where he has brain farts. And that lack of consistency, it's always sort of annoyed me in the past. But I do have to say though, once you put that aside, the lack of consistency, Jeff Petrie is one of the most important players on this team. Why? Because if Shea Weber gets injured, which let's face it, he's been shown to be prone to injury, I will get to him later. But if he gets injured, Shea Weber, who steps, up, who steps up as the next right-handed defenseman in the depth charts to take his place and face the number one units? Jeff Petrie. All right, so in that sense, I do think he's incredibly, incredibly valuable to the team, and that does affect his grade. And let's all talk about his skating. I truly do think he's one of the best skating defensemen out there. You know, and I'm talking about the whole NHL, not just the Canadians. Because while he not ha might not have the top end speed as a, a, you know, a Mick David, or I know he's not a defenseman, but I I'm drawing a blank. He does have great agility. His agility is great. He really looks like a figure skater sometimes. And there's a reason when it's three on three overtime, it's not like they start uh, Kulak. It's not like they start uh, Mete. It's not even like they start Shea Weber. 
they always go with Jeff Petrie first because they know with that much open ice and with that great skating ability, there's no one to go to better than Jeff Petrie. So with all, oops, sorry, with all that said and done, with Jeff Petrie, I'm going to have to give him a B-. You know, a little bit lower than uh, what might some people might give him, but I do think that lack of consistency really hurts him a lot. Uh, again, some nights he looks incredible, and then some other nights he just looks really average. But... Similarly to the other guys I talked about on this list, if he continues and he has a great bounce back season, he will be in the A's, maybe even an A+. plus. You know, last year alone, I probably would have given him an A because that's how solid he was. But this year, it seems like now that he's in the second pairing role, he's kind of taken a step back. And I don't know, you know, I don't know. I gave him a B-. minus. Let me know what you guys think. In the meantime, why don't we move on to our next defenseman? I'm just going to take a sip here. All right, we're going to move on to our next defenseman. And our next defenseman is Mike Riley. The poor man's Morgan Riley. What is that spaghetti sauce? Fucking takes a picture on NHL.com. Can't even wipe the spaghetti sauce off his mouth. Um, in 14 games played, he has zero goals, four assists, and he has four points. I think that when it comes to Mike Riley, expectations were kind of uh, on the basement. You know, it was kind of bottom of the barrel. Um, he's sort of like Kulak. He's sort of the sixth, seventh defenseman who's going to slot in if there's an injury or something like that. But similarly to Kulak, while he does have a great offensive um, uh, stride, he has a great stride, and he does have some decent offensive instincts, he doesn't always have the awareness on the ice to be a great defenseman in this league. And I'm not going to dwell too much on him because, again, with these sixth, seventh defensemen, I don't think it's like we're expecting the moon here. We're not expecting, we don't have the same expectations we would give to a Shea Weber or Jeff Petrie. So with all that said and done, I'm going to have to give him a C plus. You know, he hasn't been horrible, but it's not like he's making some huge chances out there and creating a lot of chances. So with all that said and done, I give him a C plus. But that doesn't matter because we are moving on to the big one, the big fish, literally, Mr. Shea Weber. Um, I don't know if you guys watched this, this TV show on Apple TV. It's called Servant. Shea Weber looks exactly like the main character. But that doesn't matter because I'm here to talk about Shea Weber, a player. So back to the P.K. Subban trade, the, the trade that brought Shea Weber to the Montreal Canadiens. I was one of those that said it's a bad trade. Shea Weber is old. He's slow. He's ugly. Uh, why is this a good trade? Now, I do have to say... I have to eat my words for a minute because I was wrong. I expected Shea Weber to decline before P.K. Subban did. And if this year is showing the tendency, it's quite the opposite. I mean, Shea Weber is playing some horseshit hockey there in New Jersey. And Shea Weber is quite possibly, I'm not going to say playing his best hockey of his career because I didn't follow him that much in Nashville. But I think I can say with all confidence, Shea Weber has been playing his best hockey as a Montreal Canadiens, you know, and again on a team that's flooded with a lot of small players, six foot four, two hundred and thirty pounds, it's super refreshing. It's really refreshing to see that. But it's not even the size with Shea Weber; it's what he brings on the defensive side, as well as the offensive side this year. It's Shea Weber. I think we all expect the defense, uh, the defenseman, the defensive defenseman that is Shea Weber. We all expect him to be positionally sound. To clear the net if there's any trouble but the points he's been putting up this year for me at least that's been a big bonus that's been a big bonus in 39 games played he's had 12 goals 19 assists a whopping 31 points <laughs> mr weber you've defined all of my expectations you've defied them because i have shit on you in the past I've had criticized you. I've said you're slow. Your ankles are mashed potatoes. And it seems like you took all of that. You listened to my videos, obviously. You took all of that and you said, you know what? I'm going to show that guy, that fat Arab speaking in his parents' basement. I'm going to show him wrong. And this year, he's been lights out. He's been even invited to the All-Star game, which I don't really care, first of all. But he's been absolutely lights out. 
I think Shea Weber this year is the Canadian's all-star. And coming to speak of it, how can I say all of that and not give him an A+. There's some games where he looks a little bit weaker, but those games are few and far between. So far, he's been very consistent, and I've been pleased with his defensive side. I've been pleased with his offensive output, and what more can I say about Shea Weber? So that will do the defenseman for now. All right, that will do the defenseman. Please let me know what you guys think, and why don't we move to the goalies? Um, I will skip Charlie Lindgren, first of all, because he hasn't really played that much. Second of all, for the interest of time. And we are going to move on to the other controversial one. So when I made this video, I said there are three players that I think is going to create a whole hubbub with the fans. Kokanyemi, Domi, and Carey Price. A lot of you might not be pleased with my grade for Carey Price. And I'm going to go ahead and say my grade right off, okay? It's a C+. I'm giving Carey Price a C+. Uh, I did something a little bit different. I gave the grade plus, and now I'm going to... I'm going to give my reasoning why. So this is my reasoning why. If you looked at the video where I called TSN, I'm going to echo exactly what I said. If Carey Price was Martin Jones, if Carey Price was Jonathan Bernier, if Carey Price was Jimmy Howard, you know, if those goalies were playing for the Canadians right now, then I would look at the goals that are being scored and I would say, yeah, for sure. The defense sucked on that goal. Uh, they shouldn't have given up an odd man rush on that goal. Uh, the stick should have been in the lane that goal. In other words, I'd be giving excuses. But for me, for a player the stature of Carey Price, which we've seen what he's capable of doing, uh, we've seen the trophies he's won, and the amount of money he's making, I cannot give him those excuses. I, I just cannot give him those excuses because if I were to give him those excuses, then he shouldn't be making $10 million and taking $10.5 million in cap space currently. I mean, think about it. The Canadians are currently sitting at about $8 million in cap space. Carey Price, the amount of money that's being spent on Carey Price, that's money that can be taken away from signing a really, really good player. And when I mean really, really good, I mean like superstar quality. I mean like maybe a Taylor Hall quality or Artemi Panarin quality. I'm not a fan of this contract and I'm a little bit worried about this contract as a Canadiens fan. I don't think it's very intelligent to give a goalie that much money. First of all, because they don't play all of the games. On a good year, they'll play 65 games. Second of all, goalies are not consistent. I mean, I'm watching the Tampa Bay game, Canadiens versus Tampa Bay, Vasilevsky and Carey Price, two Vezina winners, and they're giving goals like a hooker gives crabs, you know, and it makes no sense for me. But when you really think about it, it does make sense in the, in the way that goalies are fluid. They're not consistent. One year they can look like Martin Brodeur, and the next year they look like uh, Zachary Foucault. All right? I do not know why Bergevin had to sign him to that much money, Okay? I, I think that it's really hurting the team and not necessarily by Carey Price's play himself, but by the fact that we're not necessarily clearing up enough space to sign a good player because all of that money is going to Price. Okay, now that I've gotten the negatives out of the way, I will say though, no other goalie has the talent of Carey Price, okay? No other goalie when he's on top of his game is as dominant as Carey Price. No other goalie is as positionally sound as Carey Price, okay? I, I think those are the only two. <laughs> anyway, no, honest to God, though, there's some games where Perry Price looked like the Carey Price of old, okay? And they ended up winning. But when I looked back of the games before making this video, and when I analyzed each game, I sat down and I said, okay, which of the games did the Canadians win because they played well? Which of the games did they lose? And which of the games did they win because Carey Price stole the game? You remember that year where he won the heart? He was stealing games after games. Like, I would say one game on two, he was stealing it. After looking at the games this year, I think I found one or two where I would say that Carey Price stole that game. That is not enough because he is making Connor McDavid money. He is making Panarin money. All right? I cannot sit here and justify Carey Price's play and make excuses for him when he has that type of salary. I just cannot. People say I'm a Carey Price hater. I'm not. 
I'm really not. I like the guy. Ever since he played for Canada in the World Juniors, he had my golden star. He, he, I was a fan since then. All right? But I think that if you were to ask Carey Price himself if he's, if he's happy with his play, I don't even think he would say yeah. Because, again, we are just expecting a little bit more. It's not like his stats are horseshit. Okay, what is he? he have a 930, 903 save percentage. Um, it's not bad. 901 save percentage. It's not bad. It's not great. It's a little bit on the weaker side, but I think when it comes to carry price, that's all I'm going to say. I might make a whole separate video because it is a controversial topic. I don't want to, you know, pretend to have a crystal ball and everything, but watch out, Seattle. You might end up with a $10.5 million goalie. Who knows with the expansion draft? That, that's all I'm going to say, though. So for Carey Price, I'm going to have to give his grade a C plus, as you may be able to tell from the thumbnail. So I hope you guys really liked that video. I got to admit, I was running out of steam and running out of coffee there in the last few minutes. But that doesn't matter because if you made it this far in the video, make sure to drop a like. It helps with the algorithm. Make sure to subscribe. Make sure to leave the comment. I want to know, what are your grades? Where do you defer from me, okay? Let's have a conversation. No shit talking, none of that. If you disagree, tell me why. Be an adult, all right? L let's not be babies with diapers here. Be an adult. If you disagree, tell me why. And let me see your grades. Each player's, I want to see your grades, or at least the most important ones in your eyes. And as per usual, make sure to subscribe to Sinbin for more Montreal Canadiens talk and more hockey talk as a whole. And my name is Matt. Keep your stick on the ice.